Abby Howard. And I am Tony Howard Arias. And I guess I'll be the one to, sure. Uh, and we are currently running Black Abbey Games, which is an independent game studio. Um, our, the first episode of our first game, Scarlet Hollow, released on, geez, what, September 25th? And we're currently running a uh, Kickstarter to fund the rest of the development. All right, so I have to say one hello. It's a pleasure to meet you two. Nice to meet you. Likewise. I I got you know I've gotten to the point where I I'm I'm enjoying these conversations because I'm meeting and learning about so many new individuals that are doing great things. And I heard the just September like September was just around the corner. So before we start with what you guys are doing, um, talk about who you are. Like where did you come from? Where did you start? Where are you located? So we are located in Boston, and uh, as to how we got our start, I am a professional cartoonist and have been for the past seven years, I think. So uh, that's, I've just always loved cartooning. Um, I like writing and drives. So I just wanted to combine those. And uh, I have seven published books at this point. So I've been pretty busy <laughs> and I really love the horror genre, but I was excited to try something more interactive. So we decided to move into the game sphere, especially since Tony, uh, I, I met Tony, so I started to move in that direction. Uh, yeah, so uh, for me, I've my career has been kind of jumping around from startup to startup. Um, during my undergrad, I did a dual degree in psychology and screenwriting, and then I worked with a couple early stage startups in Boston, the first of which built um, kind of like self-improvement style meditation and diet and exercise courses for people's iPhones. And then from there, I worked at the Boston Globe and helped them launch their health publication, STAT. Um, I was at STAT for about two years, um, started to get very involved in political organizing and wound up leaving to uh, co-found a startup called Organize Together with some of my college friends and I. We built volunteer organizing tools to help um, kind of nonprofits and progressive campaigns and causes just mobilize better around issues. Um, we wound up winding that company down, um, I guess mid summer of 2019, just um, continually hitting traction problems with, you know, getting the revenue we needed to sustain ourselves. Um, been dating Abby since uh, the winter of 2016, and we got married this year. And- Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And we kind of found ourselves at this uh, juncture last fall where I'd been winding down my startup. She was finishing off a book and we didn't really know what either of us wanted to do for our next uh, project. Oh, wait, and... wait, 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 we're gonna, I'm gonna pause you. I'm gonna pause you. Cause then it's just like, it's starting a little bit too much. So oh, sure. pause you because I need to know where you guys started because the writing, we'll call it the caricatures, the mm -hmm. tuning, there's so many things that you already know how to do, but where did that come from? did it come from your family did you come did it come from like just like doodling around like where did you guys really start before the career came in and also our cat started yelling at the door just now oh, Abby, do, you do your thing <laughs> I, I have ups people and see yeah there you go they're just like they want in <laughs> she's had a rough morning little kitty there she goes Okay. <laughs> now, now she feels like she's, she's, she's part of the conversation. So tell me about like who you guys were before the profession, because um, <clears throat> being a writer and being, uh, I mean, like, just everything you've just listed off, the both of you, it doesn't just come from, hi, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to major from that. There's something that stems from you. So I want to rewind it a little bit more to get to know who you guys are as individuals. And then uh, like, what was it that led it, led you guys to each other? And well, and well, well, there's so many more questions, but let's start from <laughs> Sure. All right. So, uh, gosh, I was interested in comics ever since I first realized that that was something you could do. Uh, so I used to read newspaper comics all the time and fell in love with them. Um, from there, I started to learn about graphic novels. And I especially loved kind of the more macabre graphic novels that I could find. But that really stuck out to me as something I wanted to do because I just love telling stories. I was always writing something. When I was really young, I would put together little picture books 
and to try to get them like I was just like, okay, mom, now how do we get this published? Because <laughs> it's good enough, right? Uh, so I was always interested in that. All through middle and high school, I was constantly pitching to um, comics pub publications. Uh, none of them accepted me because I was 13. <laughs> so and I think they could probably tell. Uh, yeah, then I actually wound up switching to uh, the sciences for university because I didn't think cartooning was a viable career. I knew it was really difficult. I knew uh, it was hard to make a living that way and hard to get a following and really hard to get syndicated or anything. So I was basically like, okay, well, this will be a hobby, I guess. And I'll go into something that will actually get me a career. So I went into, uh, I was planning on doing medical science, but then I was really bad at chemistry. So I could not do that, but I was good at evolutionary biology. So that's what I studied in school. And I was miserable because I wasn't drawing anymore because <laughs> in order to pass any of my classes, I couldn't spend half my time drawing pictures. Mm -hmm. and planning graphic novels. So uh, then um, actually a weird opportunity presented, presented itself. Uh, strip search, sorry, let me start that sentence over. Penny Arcade is a web comic that um, decided to do an online like internet reality show for mm -hmm. web cartoonists to just kind of give somebody a bonus amount of money and some studio space to mm -hmm. launch their career. So I wound up applying to that on a whim. So I was just like, eh, I probably won't get this. Like I have maybe 20 comics to my name online and I won't be able to do any during the semester because I have to do school or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I got in and uh, wound up getting all the way to the finale. So I was one of three cartoonists in the finale for that show. And uh, that launched my career. It worked. <laughs> I didn't win, but. No, but, we, but, but the thing is, all right. So at the beginning, so I love the fact that your parents were very supportive of what you were doing. Um, but then you went into the sciences. So what was that moment where, I mean, and, and were they continually supportive of you where I'm in the sciences, I'm here, I'm doing my thing, I'm not loving it. Did they see that? And were they supportive of you going back into, going to your tried and true? I like to tell stories. I like to share stories in this creative way. Um, were they okay with that? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think my mom saw how difficult school was for me. I mean, I almost failed out my first semester. So. I think she knew that it was a real struggle and she was very happy when things worked out for my art. So that was wonderful. And also um, cartoonists, maybe because like we just, I mean, I mean, I'm a Marvel geek. I mean, I like, I mean, all like live, breathe, eat Marvel. People just like literally forget that I'm like that geeky person where you walk into my house and you, I have things and then they just right. surprise because my personality is just so different. But I mean, I'm that person where I was contemplating do I pay all that money and I sit for a day and a half and watch every single Marvel movie until like, you know, the last one came out. And I was like, literally for a week, I was like, do I do it? Do I do it? Do I take a couple of days off? Like, what do I do? So um, I love all about it. I mean, there's so many women, young girls that are involved in it. I don't recall any women writers or uh, women cartoonists that are out there. So is it me? Are they hiding? I mean, or are you the one of, are you a, a small community? It's, <laughs> It's, I mean, if they are out there, we're not seeing them. It's a, it's an interesting world in comics. A lot of people I feel see the surface, which is superhero comics, cape comics, as we call them in the biz. So a lot of it is uh, that, but that's actually a very small subset. And especially um, money-wise, it's a very, very small subset of actual comics. A lot of comics are actually graphic novels these days. And uh, they're incredible. And a lot of them are written by women and illustrated by women. A lot of, I know tons of women, non-binary people, uh, people of other marginalized genders, just kind of not being able to get jobs at Marvel or DC or any of the big Cape comics. And also wanting to tell very different stories than they would be if they were working for Cape comics. And they just kind of decide to do it on their own. So that's how most of my kind of cohort of cartoonists met is just because we were all doing comics online and befriending each other over Twitter and that sort of thing, just putting it out there. And now uh, there's kind of a boom happening amongst publishers who are realizing how much money they can make off of like middle grade and uh, young adult graphic novels. So uh, a lot of people are getting book deals these days. And that's where you'll see it in bookstores rather than like comic shops. Nice to know, excellent. Um, all right, so we're going to pause on Abby for a second, and then we're going to go to Tony. Tony, oh, wow. who, who are you, Tony? Who are you? I'm fundamentally less interesting than Abby. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I've 
always cared about telling stories and writing. I um, think uh, like many, many, many people uh, got my start in middle school when I decided to try and write a fantasy novel. It was terrible, um, but I put a lot of effort into it. Um, I, yeah, like originally it was just something that I never conceived of as a viable career path and kind of the storytelling and creative side of things was something I did on the side. Like part of the reason I got a degree in screenwriting during undergrad was that my original plan was to go to law school. So I figured uh, if my major doesn't matter, I might as well like have fun and immerse myself in a creative space. Um, but you know, all the while during undergrad on top of like doing the screenwriting stuff, I was also running a ton of tabletop games and building like original fantasy settings for, for people to play in. Um, and that kind of even continued post-graduation. Um, I think, I don't know. Um, yeah, after I graduated college, I briefly uh, attended law school, decided that uh, it was not nearly as creatively or morally satisfying a space uh, as I thought it might be and left pretty early on and just kind of immersed myself in the startup space and got really, really into the idea of building new things from the ground up. It's really interesting because you have law, politics, and um, law, politics, and what did I just like? Uh, there was one that I just forgot. Um, Psychology, maybe? Law, law, politics, and media. Um, mm -hmm. Behemoths, behemoths out there in regards of one, knowing your skills, diving in there, and it's fueled. I mean, those are three topics that get people fueled all the time, especially media and politics right now. Um, which one did you gravitate the most that will that is bringing such life to what you're doing right now? Like which one, cause like, you know, like um, I always use the example of when someone is, I mean, I'm Catholic and I always, whenever sure. someone's like says, I'm like, I'm no longer Catholic. I left to go to another religion. I'm like, that's great. I go, but when there's a topic that comes up, it's just like your, whatever the, the base of who you are pops up. So law, politics, or the media, which one pops up and it still ignites the passion when you're actually creating your art right now? Oh, 100% media. Um, I think the law and politics side of things felt a lot more like a moral obligation I had as an individual. And uh, after really deeply immersing myself on the politics side of things at my last company for two years and, you know, putting so much of my savings and time and energy into it. It's mm -hmm. a space that while I'm passionate about, I'm incredibly burned out on and it doesn't really bring me life. Like what, what animates me is being able to make something that people interact with and enjoy and see themselves reflected in. So now you guys have your, your separate lives. You come together, you meet, um, how did you get to the point where you found that nice little rhythm where both of your skill sets come out and flourish? That's I a think, hard question. I think before it dating or after dating, like I go, how did that? Uh, we we knew each other for like only a few months before we started. Yeah, definitely dating. after dating. We met through a, a friend that uh, I met in high school who wound up moving here and then I moved here and she started to have me over a lot more often and lived with Tony. So that's how I met Tony. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think it took until we, so we started living together and both of us were working from home at that time, I think. Yeah. yeah. Worked. Anyway, so uh, that's kind of how we started to learn how to exist together in that way. I think a lot of couples have probably realized now since a lot of people have to work from home that it's a, it's an adjustment period. Oh, for but, sure. I have asked them. many people, do they marry well during this? <laughs> <laughs> Now's when you know. Yeah. So we survived. And uh, I feel like we learned a lot of our own skill sets from that. And it's still been a learning experience yeah. as we decided to work together. But also it's been very helpful for me too. I, I think I started to figure it out when 
uh, Tony volunteered to help me with some of the more difficult parts of my business because of course I don't just get to draw all day. I also have to run a business. So um, that was extremely helpful. Also start, starting to help with uh, editing work and yeah. kind of giving me advice on what like words worked better, that sort of thing, general editing advice. Yeah. And I started to trust them a lot. So. Yeah, there, there was a very gradual transition that I think started a few months when we you know, after we started dating where um, I would be an occasional sounding board and then, I don't know, just over time got more and more involved in a very, I don't know, like, I don't know the best way to describe it. Um, I don't know, just yeah, more, like more involved in the business in general Marketing, and, and, that sort of and editorial. So by the time we just, we were at a place where we both wanted to do something new, like, we, we hadn't into the roles very naturally. Yeah, so. like we hadn't worked full time with each other, but I think we were very creatively in sync at that point. Um, what was that moment where you came up with the idea of where, I mean, like this is like now, like what, where, where did this idea come from to create this storyline? So I was, uh, Tony, since uh, he was looking for a job at the time, was starting to help me out at conventions. So I was at New York City Comic Con last year with Tony, and a friend of mine was talking with us just about doing like a... <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll save the cat. <laughs> Thank you. I'll pause for a moment. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> There's nothing we could do. <laughs> All right. So anyway, uh, I was at New, New, sorry, I was at New York Comic Con with Tony, and a friend of mine was talking about doing a, de a demon dating simulator or something like that. Yeah. So then, wait, did you say? A, wait, did you say a demon dating? Demon dating simulator. Dating simulator is a kind of game where you just kind of pretend to date these fake characters so you okay. press buttons to be yeah. like I say this thing and then the demon is like oh how dare you or oh wow that makes me think you're cute right yeah, yeah. so it's, it's a very, very Japanese thing it's a very Japanese thing and it's not I mean demons is not the standard fare but right. I'm sure they're right, right. there yeah but uh it got Tony and I talking about a fun project where it was like a horror dating simulator where each time you tried to date somebody it wound up in a horror story of some kind and that uh, idea was very fun to me but yeah. it has progressed from there quite a bit the the editor and me kept being like okay this is great that we have all of these like different little ideas for individual stories but like how do we tie them all into a coherent narrative because that's what I always care about yeah so now it's progressed into more of like a horror adventure story but also you can date people it's kind of a fun bonus part of it so so this is all right. So to right, so walk me through this, like I, I, I want to really make sure that I understand this. I get in, I log on, um, I have an avatar of some sort. So you don't have an avatar. The game is told from the from a first person perspective. It's okay. kind of in this. It's loosely in a genre that's described as like visual novel. So mm -hmm. there'll be a lot of narr narrated narration, um, and there'll also be dialogue, like overlaid with. Um, these visual backgrounds where you have character sprites mm. that are, you know, over a background. And then as the story progresses, kind of like a choose your own adventure book, you get to pick what your character says in conversation with other people and what choices are made and how things progress. So you make a character for yourself, but there's not really an avatar so much as you choose your name, you choose what city you're from, mm -hmm. you choose your pronouns and you also get to choose like a couple traits that color how you get to interact with the world. Like, are you strong? Are you observant? Um, do you do you have like a psychic sixth sense sort of thing? Is that something like a normie? Because I mean, for the I feel like when you're playing a video game, it's definitely the controller, um, not the controllies. As in, I'm coming in, I'm buying this game, I'm kind of just doing it. Um, the evolution of Pac-Man versus what it is now. Um, I mean. Where do you see video games going now? I mean, like the gaming has changed. I mean, it, it has evolved. Remember, like the well, the well, I can't the pong. Um, it yeah. was there, which of course, I mean, sorry, I'm showing my age, but nostalgic, awesome in every single way. But I mean, it has evolved so much where people are definitely getting lost. I mean, we hear about the football widows, but we hear about the the video game widows. 
um, where individuals were like, I can play with my spouse, but I don't want to, but they are, they come home from work, they have an intense job, they're really involved in this and they're just locked in and they have this entire community that's involved. Um, we've been home during this pandemic. A lot of people are just trying to find an escape and these video games and these stories and the way of succeeding in communities has, uh, has grown. Where do you see it now? Where do you see it when we go back to being open, whenever that open is? Um, and also just like the evolution overall of the gaming community, um, do you see it continually to grow or will it just get to a point where it, it just plateaus? Gosh. So uh, I agree. Very loaded. I'm a, I'm a queen of loading it up. <laughs> All right. So uh, I actually did not grow up playing video games. They were not allowed in my house. And I am thankful for that because it meant that I focused on my art a lot more. So I feel like that's been a, a benefit. Uh, but I didn't think, I don't think I really realized until I started dating Tony how much it can be something you do together. So I, it doesn't even have to be a game where both of us have a controller. I could just sit there and enjoy the story or tell Tony which options to pick. Uh, and I found it to be a really fun thing to do together. It's really interactive. It's more interactive than sitting and watching a movie, that's for sure. So I really enjoy it. And I also feel like it has a lot of the same kind of video game industry is going through a lot of the same kind of uh, the indie explosion, I guess, that uh, uh, web comics or comics in general kind of went through that helped me get a, a boost in my career, which basically was uh, just people being fed up with what they had and kind of realizing that they could tell a story in a unique way and being able to do that just because the uh, resources are so much more plentiful these days. It's the only reason we can make a video game. Yeah, and something I'd like to add is we're talking about something, I don't know the exact numbers, but like the games industry is currently like a hundred billion dollar plus a year industry yeah, and it's growing rapidly <laughs> and it's, it's this, uh, enormous behemoth that like rather than being like a, a, a giant ship that's being slowly steered in a single direction is more like this giant octopus that has its tendrils reaching right. out everywhere a fleet of ships yeah there you go. Um, there you go. <laughs> but like all going in their own directions right because because you have you have like something like say uh, Fortnite, which by itself is like a multi-billion dollar a year industry just for the <laughs> one game. And it's this, you know, competitive multiplayer environment that is its own world, um, you know, in one direction, but then you have like all of this cooperative multiplayer mm -hmm. stuff in another. And then in a completely different direction, you have things like what we're building, which is you know, a very tight narrative experience that doesn't have the same level of, I guess, like breadth to yeah. its gameplay. Um, it also doesn't have like this endless time sink where, you know, something like Fortnite, someone could easily put 2000 hours in and because it's a multiplayer game and because they keep updating it, like that'll keep going where our thing when it's finished is going to be a 10 hour story that you go through a few mm. times yeah um all of this is to say i don't think there is a single direction so much as i think it's something that's so out of control it's so accessible to people who just want to make art on their own mm -hmm. that it's kind of moving in every single possible direction at the same time um i love how you guys just um talked about just the the dimensions and the layers of what a video game is. I mean, most people, I mean, like literally every parent out there is thinking, I don't want you to sit here in front of a video game all day long and not understanding all the different levels. So um, there was like a, um, a wonderful, wonderful person in my life that I used to, I was his nanny years ago. Now he's like 27 years old, married, he's a rock star. Um, I would give him a video game and in a day it was done. I mean, he's like, he was so focused on just getting to the story. And he, and he always said, he's like, it's not about the game. I need to understand how the story ends and I can't stop until I know how the story ends. And to think about the designers, not just the, the coders, but to think about the, the visuals and thinking about the storyline and to make sure the storyline fits in is something that people just really take for granted because they're just assuming, oh my God, this person, this child is in front of the, um, the video game all day long and they should be outside and playing and not realizing it's not one or the other, it can be both. 
You definitely can. Right. Build. And a lot of the designers need the outside elements to create that, that beauty. And I also feel, right, like if you go back 40, 50 years, um, suddenly you see people being like, well, why are kids outside all the time instead of doing their homework or improving themselves in this way? And I think it's just this generational thing where, you know, uh, children have something that they're using to learn about the world and grow and experience themselves and they're really into it. And then the parents always just come in with the question of just like, well, why are you doing this instead of this thing, which I did when I was younger and is clearly good for you. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I think there's a lot of value to them. I think they teach important skills. Um, I learned to be an incredibly uh, fast and precise typist playing World of Warcraft. Um, <laughs> you, what do you mean? You didn't take typing class in high school? Like a lot of did? Oh, I did, but I played World of Warcraft in middle school. So I crushed typing class in high school. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, it is really interesting, um, and you hear this all the time in regards of um, if you're going to a bodega, you see a family-owned business, you guys have a family-owned business. You are a couple, a newly wedded couple, and you're working, so you're always together. And oh yeah, it's a pandemic. <laughs> well, yeah. the pandemic, the pandemic going on. How are you, I mean, how are, how have you guys found your, your groove in regards of we're newlyweds, we own a business together, um, we're running a business together, a guy we're creating together, and you're in this pandemic. So how has this all been for you? And Tony, you were looking for a job and then you came into this world with Abby. Like, I mean, can you just talk about that? Because a lot of people right now are freaking out because they're at home with their spouses and they're not thinking, and, and freaking out. But then on top of that, they're thinking, I would never start a business with you or, hey, maybe we should both quit our jobs and start a business. So what would you say in regards of the pros and cons of doing this together? And what would you say to someone that is thinking about doing it? So I think something that's very unique to us about like the pandemic atmosphere and everything else is we were both homebodies before this started. We both worked from home. We had some overlap in the work we were doing together. So starting a business together was a pretty mild transition. Yeah, it basically um, just meant that then our schedules were so much more in sync, which is really helpful for us. Yeah. I feel like it's been nothing but nice to just kind of be so in sync, like especially actually right up until the very day before the state shut down, I was working on a really tough deadline. And basically this has felt, besides the entire horrible crushing atmosphere of the world, uh, has been a lot nicer on me. I feel like I'm less stressed out than I was when I was on that deadline because it was just really tough. It was like three or four months of 16 hour days, no days off, just endless work. So yeah. that was pretty bad. And I feel like we were a lot more disconnected in that time just because I couldn't focus on anything else. All Definitely. I could do was like maybe listen to podcasts with Tony and that was like the only thing we could do together. So now it's like we have free time together. We could kind of just be a couple again, even though we're also working together every single day. Yeah, and with regards to this specific business, like there is a component too of, I don't know, I think there's like a, a certain degree of personal privilege we should acknowledge here where Abby has been a self-employed successful indie cartoonist for seven years. So getting together and building this game, like we had a built-in audience to sell it to. The, the, we're running a Kickstarter for it right now. It's your it's seventh almost, Kickstarter. Yeah, it's almost it funded in a day. Funded. We knew it would probably fund in a day. Um, so there was some mitigation there. Uh, but I also, um, having acknowledged that, but having also taken far bigger risks in my professional life, mm -hmm. um, I think just in general, like if you're unhappy where you are right now, and you can take a professional risk and, you know, leave a job that you hate, try and start a new career and like not ruin yourself financially doing it. Like, I don't know, take the risk. I, I, I and I don't know, this is also coming from someone who like, I, I've taken a number of enormous risks in my life and they've all either paid off or, didn't hurt that much. 
Um, so again, I have some biases here, but I went to, uh, I went to like, uh, you know, top ranked law school right after graduating undergrad, decided that it was a toxic environment and I left um, and, you know, just threw my all into finding something that I'd be more passionate about. I had an intermediary job um, before I started working uh, at the Boston Globe, where uh, it was like, you know, just writing these spammy blog posts for this like content marketing agency where they were asking me to do immoral things like writing climate change denial articles and, you know, asking for a ridiculous throughput of, yeah, just write us like 300 posts a month and we'll barely pay you a livable wage. And I was deeply unhappy there and I quit and threw my all into finding something new. And like, I feel like every single point in my life where things wound up getting better, it was because I was able to sit back, acknowledge that I was unhappy where I was. And I took a risk from there to, I don't know, shoot for something better. I think that's one of the things that um, a lot of people are, they're sitting on fear. Um, they're sitting yeah. on fear and they're seeing, they're not, they're sitting on fear and they're not getting the support. Um, Abby, you said it great where your family knew who you were from the start. I go, and you went and did something different, but they knew who you were. And I go, and just trying out and well, it, Tony, just you trying out so many different things, but knowing I need to understand that there's passion for it. And I need to believe in what I'm doing, which is, which is one of the things that people just forget. Um, we get to the point where I feel like from infancy to high to the start of college, you know who you are, you know who you are, the sports, your family, all of your different traits, your passions, things that you've been doing, whether it's painting, whether it's sports, et cetera. And you go to college or whatever next level of what that like college years and you get erased, you get right. erased and people are telling you what you should be or what you should do and what you should say. And then you find, you find yourself trying to figure out, so many years down, oh I, I, oh, I remember what I used to do. Well, I don't do that anymore. And so I love that the two of you guys figured it out so quickly and you found a way to develop something that people will love and gravitate towards. Um, so during this pandemic, I mean, what has it done for you? I mean, like in regards of, I, like, I, I started it a little bit, but I want to like really like get a better understanding for you. What did the pandemic do for you? So March 15-ish, um, February ish, you, the buzz starts happening, and then we're in like lockdown. Um, but in regards to your work, in regards to your clients, in regards of what you had done in the past, so what did this pandemic do for you? And what did you add to your life that you would have probably never done that you, I mean, you would have never done it if you didn't have this time? So I had a very busy convention schedule planned this year. And I'm actually not sure how much of this game we would have been able to finish on time because we were working up right to the last second. Uh, we would have had to cut a lot of corners. We probably would have still gotten it done, but it wouldn't have been what it is. Yeah. Just having would, this time is we really We would have useful. released something shorter for our first episode. Yeah. Um, probably with less art assets, but uh, yeah. So it's it meant that I spent a lot more time at home. I usually have to do at least three or four maybe even five conventions in the time that it's been since the shutdown in March. So yeah, I mean, uh, it's not great that I couldn't do them. I had to cancel a lot of plans and, you know, I do make money at conventions, so I didn't have that kind of income, but it didn't hurt me that bad. Thank goodness. Right. Yeah. I did um, miss, I do miss all of my cartoonist friends that I usually see at them though. So I'm looking forward to eventually seeing them all again. Yeah. And on the kind of, business financial side of things like people are still spending money right now mm -hmm. something that i think we've observed is this is the third kickstarter yeah. i did three this year. this year which is insane um, to do don't do it <laughs> but ge generally speaking it seems like people are still spending money but like people aren't spending large sums of money so something that uh, you know, you generally look for with something, especially like a video game Kickstarter is having these really, really big premium tiers where, you know, someone's maybe paying somewhere between $20, $60 for the game, depending on what you're making. For us, it's $20. Um, but then you'll often have tiers where someone can come in with like $10,000 and be like, put me in the game. 
I want to leave my mark on this. Um, and something that we found, and those tears like usually, you know, sell like hotcakes because there's people who, there's just some people who have an enormous amount of disposable income and, you know, they want to support a project that they care about and mm -hmm. they want, they want something unique and tangible like that, that they can show off to the world. And I think one of the things we found is people are still spending at those lower levels, but there's far fewer people who are just throwing $10,000 um, at something new. Um, but I don't know, things have been going pretty well so far though. Yeah, they could be going a lot worse. So we're very thankful. Uh, people keep talking about how we are not going to see a conference probably for, I mean, some people are being very optimistic saying maybe next year by springtime, um, realistically, the end of next year or the first of 2020. Um, for um, Comic-Con, it's, it's a huge thing. I mean, it's, I mean, I, I mean, I want to go to Comic-Con, but only the one in California. I don't want to go to the one here. I mean, because I, if, if I'm going to go, I want to go to the behemoth one. Um, that is such a phenomenal event. I mean, everyone reports on it. Everyone talks about it. Celebrities go to it because they can dress up and they can feel that they're free to go around. Athletes, I mean, people go because everyone has a love for cartoons. Um, when I was in Japan and China, in, especially in Japan, it was shocking to me the big, big, big books that businessmen in suits and they're all on the train and this is what they're reading. They're not reading the, the papers. Um, it's a humongous industry in Asia. So without the Comic-Cons the way it is, how has it evolved? I mean, what are you guys doing? I mean, is, is it online? And, can, and if it is online, can you get the same, I don't know, it's like, I mean, there's elements clearly missing, but I mean, are you able to project your projects in a world where they see you, they get to form relationships with you, and now you're via this, I mean, you're via Zoom? It's a, definitely not the same I've done. I think I did one panel on another convention, like another kind of a online convention kind of situation. Uh, and I will be doing another one in two weeks, I think. The 24th, is that a week? Wow, time yeah, is nothing. That's a week. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so, um, and that's for a local convention that I would usually do. Uh, yeah, it's, it's nowhere near the same. It's me and a few other people talking to each other. Maybe sometimes there's a chat, but usually not. Uh, and a chat is nowhere near like people just walking up to you or asking you questions in person. And uh, there's definitely, I mean, I don't make almost any money off of online conventions. Like maybe yeah. sometimes I'll sell some things on my online shop through the convention. But yeah, it's, uh, it's basically just not it's nothing like the convention and I don't think we're going to have one until like you said fall like next, next year fall of next year at the very earliest so I do miss it it's uh I do value the time that I've been able to spend at home I'm sure my cat is very happy that I haven't been traveling so uh, but you know I, I think it's also important to stress that like while conventions themselves uh have been gutted in terms of you know what kind of uh, visibility and revenue they can send our way, like especially in this current digital format that no one really <laughs> seems interested in, yeah. uh, which I, I totally get. Yeah, we do. Uh, I mean, that's, <laughs> but that's still just like one of many, many prongs of getting stuff out there. Indeed. So, like, I feel like most of the like most of my sales usually happen online anyway. Right. Yeah, and, like, uh, Kickstarters. Also, we started to do live streams. So we also get kind of the face-to-face -face interaction that I would get okay. at a convention, except people who can't usually meet me at a convention can now kind of hang out with me on the live streams. So yeah. I think it's nice that way. Yeah. So like for our game, we're halfway through our Kickstarter campaign and we already have like 1600 people who have pre-ordered a copy through it. Um, so while online conventions have been a uh, really, really poor forum for generating that sort of interest, there's all of these other online channels that are still really effective. Yep. Twitter has been, Twitter's been a challenge this year, but it's still been effective, effective for us. I think yeah. the, the big issue is like everything is Twitter, going to Twitter hell. Twitter challenging for anybody. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Like I think uh, we wind up, you never know what you're going to be competing with that. Day. Right. Like, wise. right. Like, um, gosh, I think 
it was like a couple days after we launched our Kickstarter that uh, Trump caught COVID, which like yeah. had we launched on the day where that test happened, like we would have just been buried. And you know, that's one of the, the main avenues we have for, um, you know, getting the word out, yeah, getting the word out yeah. kind of make getting that reach generating those impressions but i have to say i mean i have told people that so many times where marketing 101 is you have to be prepared for the unknown and that unknown is you do something and then like i don't know princess die dies and you're like oh wow we planned for this event for three months and now the only thing that everyone's talking about is princess die dying and so i always always have a plan b um and it could be a b minus where it's like i'm like okay this may never happen but you just have to know that right now, every day, the news changes. And so for our, I mean, a lot of our clients, we were like, we just said, I go, you're not marketing. You're just doing crisis management every day. Every day, you right. never know what you're going to do. And you just have to be very quick and very sharp and very like, okay with the fact that you can't just get down about it. You just have to be very creative in regards of how you're going to come up with your next plan. Exactly. And, and one of the challenges about 2020 in particular is Right. In the past, a princess die, uh, you know, dies event happens like once every two to three years. Exactly. Like, now this year, something of that mag- magnitude happens <laughs> weekly, every other week, like sometimes multiple times a week. And <laughs> it's just a lot of triaging and being like, OK, so this this is just completely changed everything. How do we how do we adjust? Like, I think for our Kickstarter launch day, something we found out the day before, and this is, you know, less, thankfully it wasn't like major political news, but it was but like- In our circles. Yeah. It was big yeah. News. So yeah. So people, like- If you pay attention to us. The yeah. exact minute we were going to launch our Kickstarter originally, uh-huh. Nintendo decided to do like a surprise, here's the new playable character in Super Smash Brothers announcement. Wait, are, are, do you launch or do you're like, oh, oh, oh. So, so, so they, they announced that they were going to have their announcement like the day before. So okay. we had like a panic running around, like our head got caught off, decided, okay, we're launching an hour early. Yep. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> then uh, uh, it seemed right alongside the Smash announcement, uh-huh. Twitter just like, broke down. I don't know if it was because everyone was tweeting about that excitedly or if it was a yep. coincidence, but it was the very minute. Yeah. So I think it, I <laughs> it, think was it was great really that we made that like last minute gut call to launch an hour earlier. Um, but yeah, no, it's just incredible. And I have to say, this is why it's amazing to be a small medium business. Um, you can make that decision very quickly versus if you're a big corporate company, it's going down the pipeline. And before you know it, all the news is already out. And you're like, we already lost our window. So your window was like, hey, I go, let's talk about this right now. Okay, let's do it. Let's go. And we're live, which is fantastic. Yeah, like a, a metaphor, an old mentor of mine, like to use when talking about like making deals with like large brands uh, <laughs> was that like a large brand is like, you know, the Titanic or like a super carrier where it's this huge boat. And if you, if they're doing any course correction, it's they, they spend like weeks at a time changing the angle the ship is moving at by like half a degree so that it'll get somewhere that it needs to be like a year later. Um, Isn't that unfortunate? <laughs> yeah. So I'm very... Part of the reason I've always stuck with small, smaller companies is mm-hmm. just that's something conceptually that I can't stand. I can't even really wrap my head around it. I always feel like I, I need to be able to make a decision and then have that decision immediately happen. I don't understand. You don't want to be a number? That's shocking. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So my last question to you guys, um, if you had... Um, Actually, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going like, to ask that last question just yet. Um, if you wanted someone to be engaged with what you're, oh, no, I'm, I'm going to rewind. This is me. This is the fun part where I'm like, I, I just like change my mind at any time. This is it. You guys said the word, like the Kickstarter reward a few times. Mm-hmm. Kickstarter is very, very unique to the masses. So one, let's talk about what is Kickstarter to you, especially because you're specialized in it, number one. And number two, why is it so important to go that route? You could have gone so many different ways to finance this project. 
Um, you clearly have a following. You're very successful in what you're doing. Talk about that because that's something that I, I, I honestly wanted, like I, um, I honestly wanted to engage with a little bit more. And I just looked at the time and I'm like, oh, I don't want to waste, I don't want to take too much of your time. I'm like, oh, we, I need to take more of your time. So <laughs> started because seven times successful, almost in, like, surpassing your number. Kickstarters are hard. They're very, very, very hard. They're very challenging. Um, most companies go that route because they just can't, they don't have money for themselves. They cannot get financing. VCs and angels aren't even thinking about them as of yet. So can you just talk about that, your experience about starting, uh, where it is right now, what are the benefits, and how should someone learn how to engage? Again, did I tell you I like to front load a lot of questions there? Yeah. All right. This is probably going to take us like 20 minutes to get through everything. <laughs> this is a well, we, don't have we have the time. Yeah. A, a nice little, some, like, just like your thoughts. Yeah. So uh, when I first started doing Kickstarter, it was very much a, I know I can't get a publisher to publish what I want like my books, uh, I just knew I had to kind of ask other people to give me the money so that I could publish my books. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of how a lot of people get the word out. Like uh, some people just do really small numbers of, of, of printing, like just a small number of books mm -hmm. uh, to get kind of their books out into the world. So Kickstarter is a great way to do that because uh, getting money from publishers is hard. <laughs> so, and it's very rare and you usually have to, it's, it's a lot of work. To it, work with publishers. it also, it comes with strings attached. Like yeah. you mentioned Kickstarters as a fallback to folks who can't get VC or angel money. Yeah. And for us, I would almost say that it's kind of the other way around because VCs and angels have all of these strings attached um, to their money. They own part of what you're creating. They're able to exert creative control. And I think, especially in a creative sphere, like making a video game or writing books, like any kind of big money control or corporate control is going to be toxic to the art itself. Um, yeah, and we know that people want it, so why not just ask them to give us the money? Yeah. <laughs> like and I know that they would want to give us the money and it meant that we wouldn't have to change what we were working on. We wouldn't have to add anything that they wanted us to add to make it more marketable. We do what we have is marketable. And another thing that you mentioned that I would love to dive into is you mentioned, yeah, we have this you know, large built-in audience uh, mm -hmm. so we could have monetized it some other way. Um, but honestly, I would say that's the scenario where doing a Kickstarter is actually valuable. I think uh, there's, there's something like maybe 25% of Kickstarter campaigns are successful. Most of them have much lower funding thresholds than we had. And mm -hmm. I think a large part of it is people run into the platform having seen the success of other things, but not seeing the work that goes into just successfully building up to a launch where I think there's this common misconception where, oh, I'll put the thing on Kickstarter and people will discover it there and they'll give me money. Whereas, yeah, there's an angle of that, but to be successful on that platform, you have to build your own audience first and bring them there. And then if you're successful, Kickstarter's algorithm will start surfacing your thing everywhere and you can get extra money. But if you're not building a strong mailing list or a strong social media following that you can push there, uh, you're just going to kind of sputter out on day one and never recover. So like for reference, um, Abby, you have 33, 30 some thousand yeah, something like that. Twitter followers. Um, you know, we, we were able to use um, this tool called Backerkit, which you know, helps out with a lot of Kickstarter management to create an email list out of everyone who has backed a previous Kickstarter that Abby ran. So we started this with this like 33,000 person social media following and a 6,700 person mailing list. And then a bunch of like wish lists and, and favorites on our Steam page because we released our first episode early. So us being able to fund in one day and be successful on that front is more coming out of all of this audience that we built on all the, uh, these other platforms over time than from Kickstarter itself. Um, I love that you said the, I mean, the key thing that I 
Um, I get so frustrated and yet I'm in awe when people don't know who their target audience is. It shocks me each, each and every single time I'm working with someone and I'm like, who's your target audience? Everyone. I'm like, no, <laughs> oh, my heart hurts. My heart hurts. So you, know, you, you spoke, you spoke to your target audience. They know you, they know what you create. Um, they follow you. Um, not just because of what you're creating, um, well, because of what you're creating, but on top of that, because of who you are and how you've been engaging with them throughout the time. I mean, you spoke about that throughout our, our talk. You've been engaging with them, not just because you need them now, but you've been engaging with them throughout. Yeah. And something that's been incredible on um, really figuring out the target audience front and narrowing things down mm -hmm. is, you know, this whole year we, we started live streaming is something that, you know, was sort of a COVID thing. Um, and through live streaming, we were able to really get to know the audience we had because mm -hmm. generally, you know, you have like the same 20 to 40, however many people it is like coming by stream after stream and being regulars in chat, you get to know about their lives and just, the kind of pattern recognition that came out of that was incredibly helpful in terms of all of this other targeting we were doing for, for our eventual launch. Um, I think that you have, but I mean, both of you guys have done such a phenomenal job in growing your business and growing your art. I mean, just like growing who you're like growing yourselves to a point where people are now watching you over you. So I'm just curious, like, Abby, do you teach people? I mean, like, are you at that point where you're educating both of you guys? Are you educating people that are following you? They've been following you. They see your successes. They're buying and purchasing what you have, what you're creating. Um, but are you now to the point where, or have you been to the point where you're educating the next generation of individuals that want to be where you are? It seems that way. Yeah. It was a very unintentionally unintentional and gradual shift, especially during live streams. People ask a lot of questions mm -hmm. and then it turns out that I do actually know things. Yeah. So I just have a baseline <laughs> assumption of, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just kind of doing things and people like it. But as it turns out, I've actually gained quite a bit of skill. I have started to understand why I do the things that I do. You're very good like, at articulating it. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> but like art wise. I, I think that both of you guys are very good at articulating exactly what you do. Just want to. Thank you. <laughs> I always feel like I'm rambling. So that's great to hear. Uh, and I actually recently uh, was asked, I mean, I, I sometimes am asked to do like little educational comics or to teach a workshop or something. And I always feel like I'm such a, I'm just drowning and not knowing what to do. But um, at the end of the day, people do feel like they've learned something from me. So thank goodness. Yeah, I guess uh, I never really set out to teach people, but I'm getting there. And you know, I, to just like go back to something we talked about earlier in this conversation uh, in terms of like kind of discovering who you are and figuring out how to go after what you want in life. And I think you, you particularly mentioned the way that college is this weird reset button that like destroys people's identities. I feel like, you know, like in terms of starting out as an independent creative, in terms of finding your space in the world, there's actually a, a relatively small number of things you need to hear initially. It's just that the way the system we live in functions and is designed, you just don't hear these things a lot of the time, uh, right? You don't hear that you should just put stuff out there. You don't hear about like, you know, some of the pitfalls to starting out, you don't, you don't hear the basic advice of if you want to do something, talk to people who are already doing it. And yeah. if you're unhappy somewhere, explore new things. Something I see a lot in, in comics and in independent comics, especially is people who think that they have to pitch their work to publishers. As somebody who did that a lot, when I was younger, I realized, okay, well, probably the best thing to do is to just do it anyway. And I just put it online. And then something will happen because of that i'm sure like i just have to put it out there and it did like the only reason i have my career now is because i decided to just start putting comics online mm -hmm. nothing will happen to you if you decide oh well i'll have to do it when i'm better at it uh you will always be getting better at it and you'll never be satisfied with what you've already done i'm sure that's how i am at least and most other people yeah so, shortly I, i've said that to people all the time like no time like the present no time yeah because if you're waiting for it to be perfect, if you're waiting to have enough money to have a kid or to buy a house, 
I mean, you could wait, 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 or you could just do it. Yeah. And like waiting for permission too. I see a lot of people who seem to be waiting for permission from some higher authority, from the people who have the money to just do something that they could be doing anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And to jump on what Abby just said, like about kind of pitching to publishers, one of the things that I got really focused on as a hobby after I left law school and I started working in the startup space was um, kind of pitching spec scripts uh, to try and do like screenwriting stuff eventually out in California and like, you know, doing all of these competitions that are the way to get into the business, which is often you write a fake episode of a TV show with Mm -hmm. other people's characters. And if people like it, they like it. And, you know, I think there were a couple of core realizations I had there. One, like, it's just such a, you know, razor wire difficult thing to succeed at because this is the path that gets outlined on a quick Google search. Mm -hmm. And two, like, I just hated writing other people's characters. Uh, I like sucked out my passion for writing for years. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there was a period where I was just like, okay, well, if this is the way to be successful in this space, if this is the way to do this in a professional sense, I I don't want to go down this path. But, you know, like you can, you can really, because the internet's such a thing, because anyone can make anything for free and share it anywhere, you can actually just keep your unique voice and make what you want to make. And one, I think that doing that kind of work right now in this game, like makes me much happier than I was when I was uh, struggling to write like a fake Archer or a fake Rick and Morty this like script. Um, hey, 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 I like Archer. <laughs> I, li- I like the shows, <laughs> but you know, it's like they weren't my characters. Yeah. Uh, so it just, it, everything felt wrong. I hated that to write these scripts, it's like I had to binge watch the entire series from start to finish multiple times over the course of a month. Um, so yeah, like I wrote, I chose those shows because I liked those shows, um, but it just, didn't light anything in me. Um, I think I'm rambling at this point. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. All right. So, well, I, I before I ask you your last question, I have to say full disclosure. I am. I mean, I like higher education. I won't even say college. Is higher anything higher than high school? Higher education is enjoyable when you know who you are and when you know yeah. what you offer. Um, I was that person that was in school, and I just like I felt like I was just going through the motions for my parents. And when I realized what I do and who I am, school became, it was a a game changer. It was like, it was a whole different thing where I'm dyslexic. I'm like a high energy. I bounce around. Like, I mean, literally I'm Tigger on any given day. Um, And being in a classroom where it was just like Charlie Brown's teacher, wah, 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 wah. And I'm like, oh my God, why am I here? But once I knew I was all about marketing and all about sharing stories, School was amazing. I mean, it was just like everything about it. The numbers were amazing. Operations, technology, everything about it was amazing. And I can create that story. And I love that you guys found, I mean, I, I'm very proud of you guys because you knew who you were, you did something and then you came back to it. So I think that's just brilliant. I think most people are forgetting over and over and over again, you are what you are and just like run with it. Just run with it. And just like, don't try to like, like fit it in a can and then cover it up just run with it because you never know what we'll get. Because like there are surgeons, there are storytellers, but I'm a surgeon and I'm a storyteller with my hands and I'm saving a life. And it's a story in there. Like I'm getting into the cavities of a body and I'm like doing my thing, like graphic, but it is what it is. <laughs> I read yeah. horror comics. And I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> and I think with higher education too, like it's great when you know who you are. And it's also great if you go in with the mindset of, this is my time to figure out who I am. Mm -hmm. I think the issue happens when you go in, you know, kind kind of like I did in a sense where it's like, I went in knowing I want to be a lawyer when it turned out to not be a thing I wanted to do. And Mm -hmm. lucky for me, because what I was doing in undergrad didn't really matter for that next step. I was able to explore myself, but I think so many people get there. They're like, okay, well, I'm, I need to be a doctor. So I'm starting like X, Y, and Z classes right now. And this is just the rigid motions I'm going through. And they never take the opportunity to try new things, meet new people, and just, I don't know, pursue something they're passionate about. 
hundred percent, a hundred percent. All right, last question. Now we're back to the last question. All right. If you had a, per a personal and a professional ask of anyone that's like watching you right now, what would be your personal ask and what would be your professional ask? Here, I can go first. Yeah. Uh, personal ask, vote. Uh, you could probably <laughs> tell from this conversation who I want you to vote for. Uh, um, but I, I'm sure, I don't know if I'm allowed to, to say that or not. But you can say whatever you like. You just can't cuss. Yeah. <laughs> just for God's sake, vote for Biden. Um, and vote for progressives on every single down ballot race you have. And uh, after this election's done, uh, uh, don't give up on fighting for a better future. Um, that's my personal ask. Professional ask, uh, play the first episode of our game. It's free on Steam. And if you like it, back our Kickstarter. I think my personal ask is similar, but uh, it's more succinct. Just be excellent to each other. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I do believe it. Be nice to people. Yeah, be understanding. Um, and my professional ask is the same. Hey, player game Scarlet Hollow. <laughs> it's free on, on Steam. You can also check out the Kickstarter. I'll add that if you feel like it. <laughs> So. I, and I will, uh, and I will literally make sure that there is a, 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 a attachment so that way people can actually find the. Great. Right. Nice. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll send some links your way after the call. Oh, oh check you're out awesome. My website, maybe. Yeah. The what? Uh, check out check out my website, maybe. To, to I, I I will we'll we'll have all those things ready to go. Um, right. Tony, Abby, thank you. I mean, like, I, I mean, again, I love just like stumbling upon people just like randomly, like I'm working and something pops up on my LinkedIn or on my Facebook or I mean, like someone in my circle is talking about you and I went on your website. And I'm like, oh, I'm, oh, I'm just going to ask them. Like I was available and you guys were like, the turnaround was like 48 hours. I'm like, yes, I love it. Yeah. So I'm so excited when I send out a because like I always say like whenever someone gets a job on LinkedIn I'm like wow that works or when you find your spouse on 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 social media I'm like really I go wow I mean I love that it works but I'm like wow really so when I send out a, a email because I saw you and I use your social media and I'm like and you respond I no lie I'm just like oh oh I <laughs> look at that it worked so I'm happy it worked and I'm happy you said yes and I love this conversation because I mean literally um, I, like I learned how to speak English when I was younger, um, first generation born in America. And the, for internationals, we live and gravitate towards the visuals to tell the story. And it helps us formulate that. And I've been taking pictures since I was little because I can take a picture. I can tell you the sounds, the scent, um, the, well, the moment. I can tell you what's happening. But if you ask me to write down something and like literally write it down, the commas and the, like, just, the grammar is just, to this day, it drives me nuts. That's why I have editors <laughs> um, because I mean, you guys, I mean, you guys are storytellers and you're storytellers in a way that most people forget, but without you, a lot of things aren't out there. So thank you so very much for saying yes to me. Thank you so very much for this really good conversation. Um, like you added a whole different level of knowledge, which I'm super psyched. Um, and um, next year, cause I, I kept on saying the end of the year, but I'm like, I go, we're still like, like numbers are going back up. The pandemic is going to like adding another element. So um, December, January, I'm coming back to a lot of individuals and I'm going to ask what happened, like what, what happened, um, yeah. story, because I want to know how would, I mean, how it plays out. Yeah. Right. I mean, I we're always happy to talk to people. Yeah. This has been yeah. lovely. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's a conversation. It's not, I mean, I'm not Oprah. I mean, I'm a conversation. <laughs> but thank you so very much. And I mean, Take care of yourself. Again, congratulations, newlyweds. Thank you. And I'll All talk right. to you soon. Yep. Bye. All right. This Thank, you so Thank you so much. Bye.